Great. Well, uh, we're ready for our next presenter. Without a, a break, uh, we are very well, very glad to welcome uh, Clayton Johnson to our uh, virtual perspective. Uh, Clayton has participated in a number of our events, but uh, first time uh, for, for a virtual event. Uh, Clayton is a veterinarian with the Carthage Vet System, um, and he is a, a partner in that system and also one of the veterinarians working with customers globally on uh, solving uh, diseases and other management issues on, on pig farms all around the world. Uh, Clayton graduated from the University of Illinois with a DVM, and uh, he also uh, completed the uh, executive veterinary program at that university. We are honored to uh, celebrate here that, that uh, Clayton recently received, uh, he was the 2020 recipient of the Lehman Science in Practice Award, which is a, a great honor for any veterinarian uh, working uh, with uh, swine medicine. So Clayton, uh, welcome to the virtual perspective. Your topic today, together with uh, Christian Harvin, is the practical approaches to guilt acclimatization. Clayton, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much, Oliver. Thank you for that wonderful introduction and thank you to the entire BI team for putting on this virtual event while we talk about such important topics as health management in our, in our sows. Um, I'm gonna speak to you today about the United States perspective to practical approaches to guilt acclimatization. Uh, and I want to start by introducing not only myself, but our business and hopefully give some credibility to the talk. Uh, I represent the Carthage Group and really we're a company of companies. Uh, classically, we're a veterinary clinic that provides veterinary services of all types to customers of all sizes and, and forms of production. As Oliver mentioned, not just in the United States, but globally as well. We also have a research program, uh, a management company that manages about 180,000 sows worth of production at this point, and then a training facility, uh, the Carthage Learning and Development Center, which perhaps some of you have come and visited. Um, we spend a, a lot of time training international folks on the U.S. style of production, sharing the lessons learned of what we do maybe well and some other things that we're still trying to figure out how to do well. Um, we have facilities that we manage and work with really all throughout the Midwestern United States. Um, and for those of you who maybe aren't familiar with U.S. production, the core of pig production in the United States is reflected on this map. Um, I share with you that my experiences, I think, are transferable to other producers um, in common uh, production situations in the United States. So I think the message I'll share with you today about the value of guilt acclimatization and the specific models in which you can acclimatize your guilts is pretty transferable across production systems, veterinary practices, and producers throughout the United States. Some really important take home messages that I want you to understand and that I'll try and reinforce throughout this presentation. Number one, if you are a farrow to finish producer, there is nothing more important you're doing for your production system health management than your guilt acclimatization program. Simply put, it's going to be hard to reach the potential of your pigs if your guilt acclimatization program is not affected and you are feeding those pigs post weaning. Now, guilt development is different than guilt acclimatization, all right? Acclimatization, we're really focused on the health management of the animal and trying to optimize that. Guilt development includes both health and reproductive preparation for the guilt and on very specific schedules that I'll share with you. Very important that we follow these schedules almost to the day, if not to the week of age for these animals. If we don't, we'll see what shows up in, in our take home message number three, which is that your reproductive efficiency on your guilts may be compromised. And that's a that's a big problem if you have it, because as Dr. Aruda just mentioned, 25 percent of your breeding events should be on maiden guilts. That's the largest percentage parity contribution of your entire herd. We're breeding more gilts every week at our sow farms than we are any other parity. And your gilts should be driving the reproductive performance of the herd in terms of conception rates and feral rates. Those parity zero animals should have the best conception rates every week when you're doing your preg checks. They should have the best feral rates that show up on your records. 
if they don't, you've got a problem and definitely something that you need to look into. We really want to do pathogen exposure um, and get the infection and recovery out of the way prior to breeding, okay? And for sure, we need the pathogen shedding to be done by the time we farrow our first litter. So we'll talk about those timelines. And then ultimately, the best way to gauge is your acclimatization program working, is your post-weaning endemic pathogen control. And when I say endemic pathogens, I'm talking about the pathogens that we know infect all of the pigs in the population. If you have good control of those pathogens post weaning, you've probably got a pretty good guilt acclimatization program. If you're lacking in control of those endemic agents post weaning, I would encourage you to put a short term plan that tries to help those pigs that are currently suffering from disease. But long term, we have to fill, fix the guilt acclimatization program. That's the root cause, and that's what will need to be addressed. I always show this slide when I'm talking about guilt acclimatization program. And if people didn't understand it pre-COVID, I think COVID has helped to drive home the importance of the susceptible, infected, and resistant triangle within individuals in a population. Okay. Most pigs, people, animals of all sort are born susceptible to the pathogens they're going to see. And if we can keep them susceptible, if we can prevent them from ever becoming infected to PERS or PED or certainly ASF, that's the route we want to go. But for endemic pathogens, ones in which we know an infection will occur, maybe not disease, but an infection will occur, we have really two options. One is the natural exposure of the animal or the intentional exposure of the animal, okay? But the ultimate goal is we're going to get them infected. And for the individual, we want to get them infected at the same time as the population so that we can gain this herd immunity. And we wanna use vaccines and if, if appropriate medication to try and minimize the clinical signs. I mentioned that the infection doesn't necessarily have to be disease, and that's actually our goal is to get the infection accomplished. So we build a robust immune response and we use vaccination to help with that immune response. We also use it to minimize the clinical disease event. And if there is any sort of disease event, we wanna minimize the volume and duration of the infection. We know those two things are directly correlated with the health impact on the guilt. And we wanna get those gilts resistant before they farrow their first litter. So they can then transfer their resistance via the passive transfer of colostrum to their offspring. I put together a, an incomplete list of endemic pathogens of swine here, and I think this list holds true whether we're raising pigs in Germany or China or the United States or South America, okay? And so they look at this list and say, well, PERS isn't an endemic pathogen in my herd, and I've actually completed a mycoplasma elimination program, and I, I don't have any influenza right now. And I think it's fair to say that some of those uh, pathogens may not be in every herd. But these are the list of pathogens producers need to consider. And if these agents are resident within your sow farm production, they are going to be resident within your growing pigs. And I do think it's appropriate to think at the pathogen level when you're thinking about putting together an acclimatization program and make sure that any of these bugs that aren't in good control in your growing pig population, we have a specific guilt acclimatization plan to try and help with the long-term control of that pathogen. Some principles of guilt acclimatization. We like live animal exposure, if at all possible. We think that that has a lot of value to, from a, a natural infection standpoint, to make sure that pathogens, which we can't grow in a lab and administer artificially to the animals, do get transferred quickly. Uh, we want to maximize the cedar animal to guilt ratio. Uh, particularly with mycoplasma, we know that, that seed, the number of cedar animals within a susceptible population needs to be as high as we can get it. Um, I would tell you that at a minimum, we want one to 20 animals, uh, one cedar for every 20 susceptible animals in the population. And if we can get that closer to one to 10, we would like that. Pens do work better than individual stalls for the acclimation process. The individual stalls, by definition, limit nose-to-nose -nose contact, fecal-oral transmission, oral nasal, all of those ways in which we know the pathogens can move. If you're in a stall situation, you've got two neighbors to get exposed to and maybe a shared trough to see some pathogens that way. Uh, but if you're in a pen, you obviously have much more interaction with other animals. Uh, we have to have vaccination certainly as a part of the acclimatization program. And I've listed here a very basic vaccination program. We'll go into more detail on that later. And then we do like to do feedback as part of our pre-breeding program if we have disease under control. 
So if you're experiencing a PCV3 outbreak, that's not the time to be doing uh, feedback. If you're experiencing a PERS instability, if you've got some sort of PED challenge, I think it's very fair to say that we would take that feedback program out from time to time based on the health status of the herd. But if those big diseases are under control, we do like to have that feedback program in place. Ideally, we want our gilts to be exposed to all the resident herd pathogens. And as I mentioned, really have herd specific pathogen targets. What are the pathogens post weaning that are giving you trouble? That has to be a part of our, of our thought process when we put together our herd specific acclimatization program. We want them exposed early in life. We want no clinical disease present by the age of breeding. And depending on your genetic line, that could be 210 days, that could be 230 days. Ultimately, we want no clinical disease by that 200 plus day range when we're breeding those animals. The body can only use calories in so many ways, and we want that animal to be able to shunt as many calories and as much energy and nutrients as it can toward the reproductive process. We don't want the immune system robbing some of those resources because it's still working on building immunity. It's still paying that cost of infection. And for sure, we want no shedding by the time of farrowing which is 115 days after we breed her, okay? So no shedding in mycoplasma would be the best example of a pathogen that we worry about there, given the prolonged duration of shedding that we see with that pathogen. Let me tell you about some things that we've historically done wrong in the United States. Um, I'm gonna talk about PERS acclimatization specifically here. You know, most of the multipliers in the United States are going to be PERS naive. And I think that's true mostly throughout the world, okay? That's the goal is starting with a PERS naive guilt. And historically, if we wanted to introduce PERS naive guilt into a positive breeding farm, a positive sow farm, we would take those gilts off site as feeder pigs away from the typical GDU flow, which is PERS naive, and do a farm specific live virus inoculation to those gilts. Okay? We would make those gilts positive with live virus that matched the sow farm they were going to. And other sow farms that were naive, they would stay with the PERS naive uh, genetic multiplication flow. But the sow farm that was positive would receive those positive gilts. Okay? Now, the naive piglets obviously would flow into wean to market facilities as naive piglets. Same thing on the, the PERS positive sow farm side, except there's a real downside to those piglets flowing out with that wild type virus. And we didn't always necessarily see clinical signs of, of PERS issues at the sow farm, but we would see it post weaning. And we would see it in the gilt developer as well. This is a slide courtesy of Noel Williams with Iowa Select Farms, where he looked at a thousand gilts that had received the PERS live virus inoculation and compared it to a thousand gilts that had been acclimatized using modified live vaccine. And if you look at the performance in each category, each performance of those thousand gilts, whether it's the mortality in the GDU or the growth of the gilts, their feed efficiency, the selection rate, the percentage of them coming in to heat at the right time, the number that we bred, the farrowing rate, the total born in every category, the modified live vaccine won from an acclimatization standpoint. And we have gotten very comfortable with saying that the MLV we think is just as protective as the LVI. And so we've seen a huge transition in the United States away from this. As we looked at the pros, you know, we always pointed to the, the strain specific acclimatization as being the value proposition. But unfortunately, we could never get those growing pigs produced from that sow farm to be consistently PERS negative. And so the, the targeted immune development really didn't bring us a lot of value because the growing pigs, where the money is, is ultimately made, would always get sick with that specific strain of PERS that we had endemic in that sow farm. And many other cons, I mentioned the poor performance of the gilts, uh, high transport costs for moving them around and not being able to take them to a sow farm until they're um, going to be a uh, much bigger weight. Uh, the fact that that sow farm virus strain can change from time to time, we just ran into a lot of troubles with that program. And ultimately, what have we switched to? We've switched to a program now where we do leverage the modified live vaccines. And even for farms that don't have gilt development on site, sow farms that don't have on-site gilt developers, we're comfortable shipping them select weight gilts and vaccinating them at the farm. Don't get me wrong, my preference would always be to begin that acclimatization program earlier than select weights. But we've been very successful using modified live vaccine in PERS naive select weight gilts, 135 kilos, coming right into the sow farm and potentially being bred right after that vaccination event. 
And really one of the biggest benefits is we've homogenized the PERS strains in our system. That lets us do things like commingle those PERS positive breed to wean farms because they're positive just from exposure to a modified live vaccine, not from exposure to a wild type field virus that's virulent and different from farm to farm. Much easier for our farms to manage. We don't have to worry about those batches of gilts that we would inoculate and get sick and maybe never cool down to a point where we think we can enter them into the sow farm. We just see tremendous benefits to this approach. And I think you can look at the Morrison Swine and Health Monitoring Project and look at the reported status of the sow farms in the United States and how they manage PERS and see that 10 years ago, many producers made this switch and no one has really shifted back. Everyone's been very happy with that change. So uh, poll question number one here, before we start to move into more specifics of guilt acclimatization, which of the following are appropriate measures of guilt acclimatization efficacy? All right, is it the number of guilt breeds that you accomplish per week, the duration of time in which your gilts spend in the guilt developer unit before coming into the main herd, the age of your gilts at breeding, all the above or none of the above? And I'll give a couple of seconds here for everybody to input their answers. Yep, so it looks like the bulk of everybody said all of the above, and that would certainly be an answer that I would agree with. The number of gilt breeds that you make every week are critical, okay? That's the ultimate goal of the farm, consistent number of gilt breeds every week and about 1% of your mated inventory population being that gilt breeding target. Duration of time in the GDU is critical so that we can get that exposure, the infection to accomplish before the breeding process and the shedding to be done before the farrowing process. And then the age of breeding is obviously important as well. If we make these gilts sick, we are going to delay their growth and we will push back, if nothing else from a, a weight standpoint, the age at which they are going to be eligible to breed. So how can we measure our program? I would tell you, look at your normal production metrics because there are a couple of those we can cherry pick to really tell if our acclimatization program is working well. I mentioned that your gilt conception rate and ferro rate should be the best of any parity in the herd. You can look at your gilt total board and I'll show a chart why that's really important, but your gilt total board drives your total board for the entire farm and total board is king on a sow farm, okay? Total board drives everything that happens. The easiest way to make sow farms better is increase their total board. Uh, parity one, parity two retention rates. We ultimately want at least 75% of these animals that we enter into the herds to get it all the way to farrowing a third litter. So if we aren't retaining them as P1s, P2s, that's a sign our acclimatization program's a problem. And I mentioned your endemic pathogen control post weaning, that wean to market mortality and wean to market growth. Some spurs per specific measurements of success, we've obviously got PERS prevalence at birth. And today we would use processing fluids and PCR as a way to measure that. PERS prevalence at weaning, um, I like post weaning oral fluids if I can get those as a measure of the PERS prevalence at, at weaning. I need to wait a couple of weeks post weaning to get that information. Uh, but I think much like the processing fluids, it's a population sample, it's easy to collect. And it's one that I'm going to place more value in than, say, 30 blood samples from piglets and weaning. And then our targets of the gilt performance in, in the sow farm are 93% feral rate target and a mummy rate. Uh, that be I'd actually go less than Dr. Uh, Ruda mentioned. I'd go in that 0.3 per liter or less. Specific targets for gilts, I mentioned 93% farrowing rate, and that has to be the highest in the herd. Uh, 15 and a half total born and 13.9 of those pigs born alive. And we only want to lose at most two of those pigs in the farrowing house. So we want to be weaning a 12 on these gilts if at all possible. Retention to parity three, 75% or better, no second litter dip. So we don't want to see these gilts have a dip in their total born in their second litter. And lifetime to wean, we'd like to accomplish 60 piglets out of those. I mentioned total born is really important as a measure of success of your, of your gilt performance. And it's because your gilt total born sets the total born for that animal's entire lifetime performance. This is an old study, but it still holds true today. These are the same animals as we evaluate the number of live born pigs that they have from one parity to another. And you can see the green line at the bottom are the animals that were very low total born. They had one to, pardon me, live born, one to nine live born pigs in their first litter. And you can see the genetic potential, the ceiling of performance of those animals is lower than every other animal which started with a greater total born. 
uh, live born. And if you look at the red line, the other extreme, the extremely high total born and live born animals, you can see those animals stay higher than the rest of the population. This is why it's critically important to understand your gilt total born because it's going to become your whole farm total born. If your gilt total born is above target, your whole farm will eventually be above target even if it's not already there. Same thing is true. If your gilt total born is below target and you're, it doesn't matter what your whole farm total born is doing today, your whole farm total born is going to be going down. It's going to be below target. So critical that we have good gilt performance in terms of total born. Patterns of gilt development in the U.S. Our preferred method would be to purchase four weeks of gilts at a time for a commercial sow farm and purchase them as wieners. And we would raise them up in our GDU with a final selection at 20 weeks of age. That's when we're going to pick the animals that are ultimately going to be selected to go into the herd. All vaccines we want complete by three weeks after that period. So we'll start our vaccination program at that 20 weeks with the gilts we've selected. We'll booster them 21 days later. And then we're off to boar exposure, to crating after our first HNS, breeding at 135 kilograms. And we've got to keep this gilt cycle moving. So if we don't have any heat, we're going to use hormones to try and stimulate that heat at 240 days of age. We'd like to get those gilts in as wean gilts and enter them into an isolation nursery. We'll vaccinate them with flu, ileitis, neurosyphilis, as well as PCV2 and mycoplasma. And I would really just call that um, standard uh, vaccination program for any growing pigs right now. Um, we'd move them to the from the nursery, the isolation nursery, into a continuous flow GDU. And I'll show you some pictures of what that looks like here in a minute. At that point, we would administer a PERS MLV vaccine if that herd is vaccinated. We keep that out of our isolation nursery just so it makes the testing a little bit easier. But as soon as they'd enter in the GDU, we vaccinate them. We'd intentionally expose them with mycoplasma. That's something we've gotten much better with in the last several years is intentional exposure using the, the fogger machines for mycoplasma. And then at 20 weeks of age, we would do the boosters for the mycoplasma and circovirus and influenza vaccines, as well as begin their pre-breeding vaccines with parvo, lepto, and erysiphilis. This is a picture of a typical farm we would manage. You can see the isolation building here on the left. It's connected via a hallway with that gilt development unit, which is connected to the main sow farm, consisting generally of a couple gestation barns and farrowing. But you can see where he'd like to enter in those wieners all the way on the left in the isolation barn and move them through from there. Typical example of an isolation nursery, what that would look like on a herd that we would work with. Uh, bring those pigs in, generally going to keep them in that nursery for at least eight weeks. So if we buy four weeks of gilts, that means there's two groups of gilts in that isolation nursery at all times. And every four weeks, we're moving the oldest group out into the GDU. That GDU is really one barn, two rooms, and it's set up as a uh, feeder to finish barn um, where you've got a grower on one side and a finisher on the other. We do, for ease of feeding, move these animals every four weeks. So we move them up to the next batch of pens. It allows us to optimize space so we can customize the size of the pins so that we're always moving one pin up to its next pin four weeks later. And the pins get bigger with every stage of production we move them up to. So find it's easiest to manage the uh, feeding program that way. We don't have to change what bins or what diets the gilts are on in their pins. We move them from one pin to another and that pin is always receiving the right diet for that age of animal. All right, second poll question. How can we tell if the gilt populations are being overwhelmed by our cl acclimatization? Increased morbidity, increased mortality, decreased growth, all of the above or none of the above? This is one piece that I think you can learn from our experiences on the um, live virus inoculation for PERS piece. And it's something that we're really not perfected yet in terms of the mycoplasm exposure. I mentioned that we are um, getting better at that. Uh, we're, we're able to uh, grow up the organism using pigs as our, as our growth model, harvest the organism, quantify it, and definitely get the pigs infected, but we still haven't got it precise enough yet to guarantee that we aren't gonna have some performance impact to those gilts. So I think you guys are right on track with where I was going here. All the above would be my answer to this. Too many sick gilts, too many dead gilts and poor growth on our gilts are all signs that our acclimatization program is overwhelming the gilts. We need to rethink the exposure dose. 
the timing of exposure, the vaccinations that we're using and the medications to try and minimize the unintended consequences of that acclimatization program. A uh, control challenge is very easy and practical to accomplish with the commercial MLV vaccination. I think I've hit that on PERS. Uh, influenza is another one that we've uh, had some good success with um, on wean guilt uh, here recently. Uh, but remember, populations can be overwhelmed. Go back to that susceptible infection and resist angle, okay? We can overwhelm those gilts if we give them too high of a dose of the pathogen or we don't have our vaccination and medication program optimized to help them manage that challenge. So we want that to start as early as possible. Uh, and the economics of unstable health post weaning will absolutely justify the acquisition of space for, for wean gilts or the, the purchase of space, the building of new space for a gilt developer on site. And I've sat in many board meetings and presented many times the value proposition of adding guilt development space to owners of, of pig farms. And there will always be an accountant in the room who will quickly remind that owner that we're not going to raise a single extra animal out of that farm, that we are going to invest in facility space. We're going to spend money and we're not raising the mated inventory one bit. We're not going to improve the number of animals we're pushing out at all. Um, and I, I have to go back to that post weaning performance as the value proposition. If we can improve per stability, mycoplasma stability in, in particular, we can justify the addition of that space. You know, PERS, influenza, and mycoplasma still are the biggest problems that I deal with all the time. And I can't fix all three of them necessarily. But mycoplasma in particular, if I can remove that one from the equation, I make the impact of PERS, I make the impact of influenza much more tolerable to the producer. If we are going to use cedar animals, it's important that we don't pick old cull sows. That's the biggest mistake that I see being made with cedar animals is we've got a bunch of parity eight, parity nine cull sows that, you know, we're just going to ship to slaughter anyway. So we can take those down to the GDU and use them as cedars. Remember susceptible, infected and resistant. Those parity seven cull sows most likely aren't shedding the most important pathogens on your farm. Use gilts that have given you a signal that they're not good breeding animals, gilts that have never come into heat, gilts that aborted or have had to be with because they were a preg check negative or a turn. Okay, those animals are the most likely to still be in the infected stage and shedding, and those are the ones that we want to introduce to our susceptible animals. Minimum gilt vaccination program, weaning, circo, myco, and flu. In the nursery time, ileitis and erysiphilis. And then when we get to selection, we booster the circo and myco as well as the influenza. And we're typically going to killed influenza vaccination at selection time. And then we begin the pre-breeding vaccines with the parvo lepto erysiphilis, which will booster three weeks later, in addition to boostering that killed influenza vaccine. I think it's always appropriate for us to provide a contingency plan for our producers and understand that the ideal gilt acclimatization program isn't always going to be practical or possible in every situation. OK, and I would offer the consideration of parity segregation. If you're in a situation where you have to bring your gilts in as selects and you're not comfortable that your acclimatization program is going to result in gilts that have been through the infection process, are no longer shedding pathogens and, and are immunocompetent at the time they farrow their first litter, you know you're going to have some, some performance challenges post weaning in those parity one offspring piglets. Maybe you can look at parity segregation as a way to manage that at least in the short term, until you can improve the acclimatization program to feel comfortable mixing those parity one pigs with the parity two plus pigs. We know those parity one pigs, even in a well acclimatized system, will have higher mortality, higher morbidity, poorer growth. We can optimize those health management resources if we have parity segregation and those parity one offspring go to their own sites. Even if we just put them in their own rooms within a site, there's a value proposition there. We can adjust the vaccination program, adjust the medication program, adjust the nutrition, the environmental uh, management of those pigs. If we're in a contract production situation, we can send those pigs to our smallest sites so that we can fill those sites in a reasonable amount of time. We can send them to our best producers, the producers that we have the most faith in that, that can handle that pig that's got a health challenge. Um, that's something that you can consider if good guilt acclimatization is just not going to be possible. 
All right, so same take home messages that we started the presentation with. Your acclimatization program is the foundation for your swine health management system. If you are a farrow to finish producer and you are having a hard time with endemic pathogen control post weaning, you've got to look at your gilt acclimatization program as really the core of what's giving you that problem. And somewhere in that acclimatization program is the root cause of the health challenges that you're having. Gilt development includes both the health pieces of acclimatization, but also the reproductive preparation of the gilt. I mentioned boar exposure at 165 days of age. The gilt can't be sick at that period, right? We need her focus to be on reproduction. And if she's sick, if she's not feeling well, we can do all the boar exposure in the world we want to. It's not going to matter. Okay, so those two programs need hand. Maiden gilt reproductive efficiency should be the best of all the parodies in your herd. Conception rates and feral rates, not total born. Okay, total born won't be the best, but it's critically important because it sets the stage for the future total born. But your conception rates and feral rates on your gilts should be the best that you have of any parity in your herd. Pathogen exposure should ideally result in infection and recovery, and recovery means no shedding prior to breeding. But absolutely, we have to have the shedding done prior to farrowing and mycoplasma is the pathogen we have the most issue with because of its prolonged duration of shedding. And ultimately your post weaning endemic pathogen control is the ultimate measure of success of your climatization program. With that, I very much appreciate the opportunity to be a part of the program. And Dr. Oliver, I will turn it back to you. Clayton, absolutely bang on time. Uh, very impressive. Uh, literally the clock hit zero and you, you were finished. So. Thank you for uh, excellent timekeeping and for uh, a really enlightening uh, presentation. I, uh, I always learn uh, something uh, when I hear you uh, present. So thank you, Glenn.